Um, the first talk of the morning is Kreshenir, Kreshenir uh, Yosich, uh, and the title Mathematical Modeling and the Rational Design of Synthetic Microbial Consortia at the University of Houston. So, um, I'm going to talk about this, this, uh, this work that I've done with, uh, and, uh, mostly with um, <coughs> a collaboration with Matt Benestop at Rice University, who's all people that have worked on the experimental side, but I'm also the, my lab, and uh, I think that's the most important projects. And so, um, I'm going to start with, you know, I'm sure a lot of you have seen these figures before, so this is, you know, maybe consider the, the dawn of modern synthetic biology. Synthetic biology, the thing that we currently do it, this is a paper that came back, up, uh, back, up, back, back in uh, nature in 2000. One uh, is a genetic switch where there's uh, two genes that turn each other, that co-repress each other, co-repress each other, and so they act. But one is on, the other is off. And the other is a really similar circuit, just composed of three, uh, of three genes that uh, repress each other in, in, a, in a circle. And so this generates oscillations. Right? And both of these, if you look at these papers, both of these were inspired by uh, dynamical systems models, simple dynamical systems models. Now, these were not meant to capture the behavior of these systems exactly, but more to motivate the constructions of these circuits and then predict the behavior, the quality of the behavior of the circuits that would then be observed uh, when they were constructed. So, what are, you know, now that we're almost 20 years later, uh, where are we with the modeling now? So how, how can we use mathematical modeling to guide synthetic biology? So we come to the point, and as I'll hopefully demonstrate, that where um, guess and check really becomes very difficult when you're constructing synthetic systems. Right? So there are I mean, increasing complexity. I'll talk about systems that are constructed between different strains that communicate with each other. And so just checking all the possibility exhaustively becomes very difficult. Some, some, some modeling to guide a design will be necessary, just from an engineering perspective. Um, now, what can modeling do for us right, in this situation? So, <coughs> from a scientific perspective, you can identify the mechanisms. Once you build a circuit, once you fit the model, and you're satisfied that it describes the behavior that you observe, you can try to identify the mechanisms that make a circuit behave in the way that you observe the behavior. Um, you can, from a more engineering perspective, you can predict the behavior of the circuit from a few experiments. Right? You can go into, for instance, uh, ask the question, how does a circuit or a, uh, a consortium behave uh, as you change the, uh, the environment in which it grows, uh, you change the different parameters. Uh, you can, if you have a good model, you can fit the model to the experiments in a few, exper a few experiments and predict it to a much larger range of uh, situations. And of course, you know, this is what I talked about, kind of design of networks with desired properties. So ideally what we would like to do is, as engineers, construct a network or a circuit uh, on paper or on a computer, and then just directly translate that into a biological system and have it behave as you predict it. <clears throat> now, so I'll talk mostly about the first two of these, right? So the first, so identify the mechanisms that make the circuit in a critical way and predict the behavior of the circuit from the experiments. So most of what I'm going to talk about are actually uh, engineered communities or engineered microbial communities. Uh, so there are different strains that are co-cultured together, communicate with uh, one another, and then the behavior is emergent from this interaction. Right. So if you just grow each of these strains individually, you wouldn't necessarily see anything interesting. But once they're co-cultured, the communication between them is a sort of network, a loop, and that makes the certain behavior in a particular way. The first one, so this is a work I think with Matt Bennett's group, uh, graduate students that work there, Jimmy in particular, did most of the experiments. Uh, and uh, J. Kim Kim, who was at, uh, who was doing Danny, Danny Porter, was here yesterday. And, uh, and so Jay is actually currently in Danny Porter's uh, office over at the mission. So um, the first circuit that we looked at at this type was an extension of this uh, dual feedback oscillator that was built in Jeff Hasty's lab mm -hmm. so 11 years ago. This is, um, if you look at this, this is again um, uh, one, no, one gene that uh, activates itself in the opposing gene of the circuit, mm -hmm. and one gene that represses itself in the opposing gene of the circuit. Mm -hmm. So this is a very similar, if you look at neuroscience or, or standard neuroscience models, very similar to a Wilson Cowan model, 
and exhibits the same types of oscillations, you could say mechanisms. So this, this is an oscillated circuit. Again, in this paper, it was constructed in a single cell and exhibited robust oscillations over a range of temperature parameters. The idea is to actually then take this particular gene, or uh, related gene, and express and um, have it on a plasmid in only one of the strains, right? So essentially break this circuit up in, among two different strains. One strain that contains only this part of the circuit and mm -hmm. activates itself and the opposing strain via a quorum sensing molecule. A molecule diffuses across the membrane and through the medium and then activates the same gene in its all, in both in itself and also activates in the, the uh, corresponding gene in the other, uh, in the other strain, which is called culture. And uh, again, there's another quorum sensing molecule, the orthogonal quorum sensing molecule, that then also is expressed by the opposing circuit, but represses itself and the opposing, the opposing circuit. Right? So same circuit as here, but then constructed, separated into two different interacting strains. And if you, so this can be the circuit, that, you know, to implement this takes a bit of work. I'm not going to go through the description right here, but this is essentially the activator strain, this is the circuit that implements what I've just told you about in a little more detail. And here is a circuit that represses strain that implements the, the repressing part of it. Here is quorum sensing molecules in green and red that fuse across the membrane both ways and couple the two string, strains together into this, uh, into this uh, type of circuit we just discussed. So uh, you built this, you know, tinker around this took a little bit. Of, so this was not, you know, this was not, this, type, this was really engineered. It was tinkering and with uh, checking and guessing. Well, we didn't have a model a priori of this, mm -hmm. but but uh, Jake Young then uh, later on, once this was built, did create a model, a relatively large uh, model of 17 differential equations, delay differential equations, that captured in detail the interaction between the components in these two strains. Right? And then I'll talk you a little bit about the predictions of this model. Uh, so if you just throw the activator strain on its own, you can see much. So what you're looking at right here is a a uh, microfluidic trap, uh, which forces these uh, bacteria, so E. coli, of which these uh, genes are expressed, uh, to grow in a uh, two-dimensional sheet. And you see just the activator strain, the strain grown on its own. You don't see anything interesting, right, because it just activates itself. There's no oscillations. The loop is not closed. This is only half of the circuit, so this is not surprising. But if you co-culture two strains together, you close the loop. And you, the communication between the two strains here, the activator strain and the repressor strain, causes them to oscillate. And I'm not showing the repressor strain on its own because all you can see is just black because it just represses itself. There's no expression. Um, so um, one thing that we noticed at this point is that the you know, these are relatively small traps. You're looking at about a hundred micron by a hundred micron trap, uh, and diffusion is relatively quick across here, right? And so you see a little bit of a maybe a little bit of a wave if you kind of maybe try to convince yourself of you know, some. Maybe a completely synchronous oscillation, but relatively strongly synchronous. Excuse me. Oh, excuse me. Yeah. Can you just explain what's the yellow and what's the blue? So the if the yellow one is the uh, expression in the repressor stream. Right? So this is essentially you have a yellow fluorescent protein that's co expressed you know, to, uh, to essentially tell us what this stream is on. We have a blue uh, cyan fluorescent protein that's expressed by the actual stream that that stream is on. And so uh, this is the, the blue, the cyan, is the activator stream, and the uh, uh, yellow is the expression. So I'm only showing you, when, when I put points in the setting, I'm only showing you this one because if I show the yellow one, you can see it just presents. So some cells are still in common yellow. There's communication. Right. There's communication in between them. Exactly. Yeah. For instance, so these, this is the, the activator stream, would be the one that's in the corner on the, in the next in the movie. The repressor strain is actually most of the trap. Uh, they communicate with one another and amongst themselves we have these quorum sensing molecules. And they close this particular circuit. They're physically separated initially. No, the, you can't really do that. So this is a trap you just put in a few cells and grow whichever way. It's, really, it's, very, it's very difficult to control the arrangement of the different strains. And sometimes you actually get only one strain taking over the trap, in which case it's So they're sort of competing with each other for growth as well. They are. Right, and that's that's actually something I'm not going to get into. The spatial arrangement of the screen is a question of that question. But that's not something. So we assume that they're uh, we'll later on actually have you know, some tricks to get well mixed. So, so uh, to ask about this, so this was a few years ago. So we next asked uh, what happens 
when you let these strings grow on a much larger trap, so this trap is, you don't even see the entire thing, but it's, uh, the previous trap is 100 by 100 microns. This trap is 2 millimeters long, so 20 times larger than the previous trap. The, um, you can measure in separate experiments the uh, diffusion distance from a particular location inside this trap. So uh, the, this, the trap is open, so uh, it's phone sensing signal molecules also diffuse across the, uh, the end points here, the boundaries of this trap. The diffusion distance is about 50 microns, 30 to 50 microns. So the coupling between these cells is relatively low, right? So this cell over here will not see a signal from the cell on the other side. So this is about, this is about at least 20 times, this is 100 times, sorry, 40 times the diffusion distance. Uh, probably more, um, it's more close to 30 times. But what you do see is in this particular circuit, if you, if you wrote, is a relatively uh, coherent oscillation across the entire trap, even though you have only local coupling. Yes? So what happens when the signal is received? Is it degraded or is it... Uh... Uh, it is it is degraded. So uh, yes, yeah. There's yeah, yeah, actually yeah. That's a good question. Right? There's actually yeah. There's there's a few details that I'm skipping here. There's actually something out here that degrades the signal <coughs> to make this, to make this really work. Otherwise, you just get that yeah. signal. And the initial condition has them sort of separated. Uh, uh, you can't really control that. Yeah. You just you just do it a bunch of times. You get a lot of oh, in this in a big trap. Yeah, and yeah, it's very hard to control these. You just, you know, you see this with a few cells and you let them grow, and you hope that they're intermi sufficiently intermingled once they grow, so that you get, you know, it's not one half here and another half here. And then you get the striping. Something. Yeah, so the striping is something that, that's a question I'm not going to really talk about here, but uh, it's, it's an interesting way to get a striping. And did you say you can, you can mix them? <clears throat> You can do it you in can, mixed. Uh, you, you can mix it. Not, not in, not a, you can You can do separate experiments in which you can mix them together in wells. So you put them in a uh, test tube or something. Yeah, exactly. And then so I'm going to describe those later on. Yeah. And though, they yeah. will oscillate nicely. So yeah. this is. Uh, so, but then you don't have the spatial component. This is what the very next thing is. So okay. here's the question: right. Is why do you get synchronization across space in a um, <clears throat> if the communication is on board? Right. So that was a question. <laughs> And uh, to ask that, to, to kind of you know, have some thoughts about this question, we uh, Sorry, uh, <coughs> I, I'm, I'm a little puzzled. So when the large trap is seeded, yes. it's a mixture of blue and yellow. So what you get is usually what you can start with, and you have a separate paper. So you can start with two or three cells up to maybe 20, 30 cells. Mm -hmm. so it's, you know, they have to be, so put a pressure wave that puts the you know, jams the yeah. cells inside, mm -hmm. then they start going <laughs> where they are initially. It's really hard to you can somewhat control how many you start with initially, but where in the trap you start with is difficult to control. But nevertheless, you do get this strength. Yes, so, but not always. Not always, right? So you start with sufficiently many cells. It's kind of one of these things. You start, to, you do an experiment. Sometimes you. So, so what are other kinds of uh, special patterns? So in a, in a, a different paper, which I just published. Uh, is synthetic biology. Uh, we look at seeding this with a different number of cells initially. So from two, when you start with a couple of cells, you essentially get mostly everything you know yellow to one side. Everything this wasn't an oscillator, but just two, kind of, uh, uh, two strings that you can induce just because they're interesting in spatial patterns. And if you as you as you uh, introduce more cells, you get more and more complicated patterns <coughs> because there's more intervening things. If you start with a few cells, you get a much more spatial. Uh, separation between strings. And uh, there's <coughs> the, the spatial organization, as I said, is, a, is an interesting question. But it's all yep. When you say the signal is local, you mean the whatever degrades the signal is faster than the diffusion? Well, actually, the degradation mostly happens through diffusion across the boundary. So oh. it's a, it's, these are open boundaries, and so uh, and the degradation as well. Mm -hmm. But the diffusion across the boundary is mainly the cause of the degradation. So you can, Write down the models, and you can yeah. see that the uh, that the signaling depth depends uh, essentially. Uh, it doesn't even surprisingly it doesn't even depend on the diffusion constant. It depends most, uh, almost exclusively on the on the height of this of this, uh, of this track. Yeah. Yes. Um, the question is: uh, so it seems there to be less uh, induction at the border between the two cell types. Mm. Yes. Uh, mm. That is so. Yeah, that I don't really know if that's just a trick or yeah, probably. I don't. I can tell you why. Do they also respond to some self signal? 
Yeah. Uh, okay, so sorry. So the, it's a it's a the, the so the strings communicate both. So the repress string represses itself and the other. So it's like a <coughs> it's, it's really like excitation and inhibition in, in neural networks. Excite stores cells, excite for cells, and inhibit cells, and inhibit cells. It's inhibit themselves and excite for cells. It's the same. Thing. Right. So uh, Chen Yi um, uh, then built these different type of um, variations of the original circuit by removing this self uh, excitation and the self inhibition, this uh, self repression and self activation in the circuits. Right. So you get four different variants depending on which of these uh, self inhibition or self activation move. And we just name these in different ways. So P two stands for uh, both of these arrows, both positive arrows, and two stands for both negative arrows. And if, if there's a P1 or a subgroup of one here, that means that the corresponding arrow has been removed. Four different variants you can ask now grow these in the same environment. You can understand mm -hmm. caveats that you have some limited control. But if you look at relatively similar spatial arrangements, emerging spatial arrangements, we get lots of trap is filled. And you see that if there is, uh, I'll just show you two uh, movies right here, but if the positive feedback loop is included, you see relatively coherent oscillations across the entire track. But if it's not included, the, um, the, you still get oscillations, but they're local, localized. This is just one example movie. This also happens in, in, in other situations, in, in wherever we try to show you in the next slide. But the removal of this positive feedback loop really desynchronizes the oscillations across the track. So we asked, why is this the case? So just to recapture right Sorry, here. sorry to sure. bring in. So interesting, but if you just go back, so P1N1, if you go back one slide, yeah. uh, you know, why does that, what, what that's just got a stable, that just has a stable solution. No, no, this, this will oscillate, essentially oscillate. It's a delay. It's, it's, it's the, the signal oh, is delayed, delay. and then that's what makes it oscillate. That's a good question. Uh, there, these are not, if you, if you, um, if you, you can build this, models of this, these oscillations are not as stable, not as, as, uh, as robust as these oscillations. So one last follow question. The growth is the same for both. Mm -hmm. As far as as far as you can tell, there's no large difference. It's, a, it's like another paper where we looked at effects of growth that can change things dramatically as well. But in this case, there it's approximately so you can test it. Most of the strains that I'm going to talk about grow. The, the, you know, the fact that they have the, their different strains doesn't mean they grow. All right. <coughs> Okay, so, uh, so back to this. So, um, <coughs> so these different types of circuits all oscillate. So what I've done here is just to uh, better represent the spatial temporal evolution of these patterns. We took uh, a trap, averaged it across the uh, vertical dimension to get a line, and it stacked the line at different times into, into a single picture. So you get essentially space and time in these figures. If these are coherent, right, so you get nice. It's an exchange of yellow and black that means that you have coherent oscillations across the entire across the entire trap, and if, if these break out, that means that uh, the, um, <coughs> sorry, different parts of the trap do not oscillate synchronously. In small traps, in these hundred by hundred micron traps that I've talked about before, regardless of what type of strength, the what type of architecture you use, you get coherent oscillations. The frequency changes a little bit, but the oscillations. Are in these larger traps, you get coherent oscillations if you include the positive feedback. Again, this is just two examples, mm -hmm. this works another example as well. And if you exclude it, if you don't include this positive feedback loop, the uh, oscillations break up and you don't get coherent oscillations. Especially after a few steps. Yeah, again, you can quantify it via this chromosome that order parameter. And uh, compact traps and small traps, you get high order parameters and several repeats of the experiment. In, uh, in the large traps, you get high order parameters with positive feedback and small order parameters without positive feedback. Yes. And the only difference is the size? The only difference is between the, the size. Between this and this, the only difference is the size. Yes. So here, this is compact. Mm -hmm. Presumably, cells can communicate relatively. You know, this is 50 microns is about the, uh, the distance at which they communicate. This is about on that order. This is uh, uh, 2,000 microns, so it's much larger. But if you if you did the order analysis just locally, in on the right hand side, would you also find it? Okay, I'll talk about that. Okay. Um, so, so 
to ask, you know, why this happens, uh, what, what, uh, what we did is to create a model system. So in a model system, which is entire trap, and imagine it consists of a bunch of compartments, each of which can be modeled by the same set of ODEs that we talked about, talked about before, these seven these ODEs that we used in the previous paper, which were different the parameters were fit already to that particular, uh, to those experiment, to that experimental data. And then we coupled those via diffusion. So the only really thing that we needed to uh, add to this model was this um, the speed of diffusion, which we knew from, uh, again, separate experiments. And so how do you analyze this uh, that asynchrony occurs here? So, uh, well, first, uh, the results of the experiment, sorry. Um, in, the, uh, in the numerical experiments of this, you see very similar behavior, right? So if you have, uh, if you add positive feedback, you get very high order parameters. And even when you get low order parameters, like in some examples, it's mostly because the population breaks into two uh, parts that are out of phase. Uh, and if you exclude a positive <coughs> feedback loop, you get much less synchronous oscillations across them. You get, you get oscillations, but they're, they're not organized across the entire, uh, across the entire track. Same size as, as in the experiments. Uh, so how do we how do we can we analyze this? So um, the idea then is to take uh, a, again going back to neuroscience. Uh, people have looked at synchronization and uh, entrainment for for a long time, going back to uh, volume four of cardiac tissue, and then uh, Barbara Mitchell and Nancy Capel and others in neuroscience. What they've done is uh, look at the phase response technique. So it's fairly classical. The idea is to take <coughs> the output of one of these strings, right, and look at how, in this model, how does uh, the inhibitory and the, sorry, the excitatory, so the, the activating and inhibitory pressing signal diffuse from a population that's here at the origin in this picture, right? So this is the, um, the level of that signal at a particular distance from the population in the middle, right? We, we, this, is, uh, this is essentially an empty trap except for a population that's here in the middle, and then what we do is measure that signal, signal received by a population that just doesn't express anything, just sits there at a particular distance from the population in the middle. And what you see is that the signal received at about 30 microns of the speed from this uh, center population is pretty pulsatile. So here is the activating, here is the repressing signal, but they sort of look like pulses in time, which makes the analysis a little bit simpler. Because what we can do is then use the phase response technique, which essentially what the phase response technique tell you is that if you have an oscillator and you receive a perturbation at a particular point in the in during the oscillator phase, it, uh, what you can measure is then how much that perturbation uh, shifts your phase. Right. So, for instance, am I walking and somebody pushes me and I stumble and I keep on walking? My phase is going to be perturbed, but depending on where the push happens during my uh, during the cycle of my step. Uh, the perturbation can, can do very little if both my feet are on the ground, or can do a bit, can advance my phase a bit if I'm pushed like I'm, when my, uh, one of my legs is in the air. And so the phase response curve essentially measures that, right? So for instance, in this case, the uh, perturbation here would advance the phase, or perturbation here would delay the phase in this simple example. So you can do the same thing uh, for this in this model system, and measure the phase advance and the phase delay. And once you put these together, <coughs> Uh, you can actually then couple via the space uh, response techniques. You can actually look at two populations that communicate with each other and uh, predict what the phase difference is going to be on the next cycle, given the phase difference at the present cycle and these phase response curves that you just computed. Okay. Very standard. This is relatively standard uh, analysis. And what you find here is that the, uh, the addition of the uh, positive feedback loop extends gives you a very large region where phase differences map, where relatively large phase differences can map to negligible phase differences on the next cycle. Right? So synchrony occurs very quickly. And these, uh, uh, for in the case of the positive feedback loop, if you do not impose a positive feedback loop, uh, phase differences, do, the region where phase differences are <coughs> decreased from cycle to cycle becomes much smaller. So, <coughs> You can then uh, look back at the uh, experiments. If you start with two populations with a small phase difference, in the case of a positive feedback loop, that diminishes over time. A larger phase difference, again, diminishes over time. If you have a, even a larger phase difference, that kind of persists over time because you're outside of the region where it's going to be pushed together. Uh, for if you remove the positive feedback loop, you get a lot more synchronization. Now, 
This gives you a little bit of an idea for, so you, you see the same thing, just to mention this. You see the same thing, it's experimental data. If you look at two different populations nearby, uh, these differences do not shrink typically if you have the absence of the uh, uh, positive feedback loop, and they tend to shrink and stay and not stay synchronized if you have the presence, if you have a uh, positive feedback loop. So, Chris, may, the is the positive feedback loop here, is this the hysteresis that's causing this uh, the resistance to yeah. phase so, perturbation? So, so, okay. This was the most difficult, this is the most difficult paragraph to write in the entire paper. We wrote it probably like 200 times. Uh, because now when you have this, you can actually look you know, into the 17 dimensional, 17 differential equation. You can ask what are the molecular, molecular mechanisms that cause this. And it, it, it just isn't really easy to explain. You know, there's a several steps that are involved here. Um, you know, the best you can say, you know, the effect is really to pull the two phases together much more effectively, but the entire mechanism is really, it's relatively complex. And uh, I don't have a really simple, gratifying simple answer as to why. <coughs> yes? Are the 17, is it 17 equations? Yes. They're in your paper? Yes. Oh, great. Yeah, so it could be, could be just because we didn't see it, but it's, I know, uh, so yesterday we talked about uh, models. I think some models really, especially if you look at, dig deep into them, are just irreducibly complex. And I think this would be one of those. But uh, you know, so, so um, if you were to, to take a look at a much simpler, you know, kind of combination right. of positive and negative Sure, feedback, sure, you, you could. Yeah, but I'm not sure. Is, there, not any, is there any kind of clue there as to whether, yeah, you know. So as I said, right, it's, it's essentially, you know, up, when you come down to it, what it is, is this molecular mechanism, which is just like when the pulse arrives in a particular phase of the cycle, this pulls the phase in just the right direction. You know, you have to this, uh, the, uh, the existence of the positive feedback loop essentially amplifies the signal locally and pulls the phase just in the right direction when it's received. Right, so, 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 so one way to think about the positive-negative feedback combination is that the positive feedback is creating a, a switch mm -hmm. and, the, uh, and the negative feedback is moving you between the two uh, is hysterically moving you around. I see, I see what you're saying. Yeah. And and so the, my question was whether the ah, okay. the, the phase robustness is mm -hmm. arising mm -hmm. because embedded in this there is a this switch in effect which is which is basically resetting you more yes, more uh, efficiently than it would be with a pure negative <coughs> feedback yes. oscillator. I th I think that's the case, uh, but I think there's a little more to more to it. Well. Yeah. Can, can I can I just follow up a little bit? I mean, try not to ask, but. Uh, so the positive feedback, together with the slow negative feedback, would give you a relaxation oscillation, which yes. is what exactly that's what I said. Right? Which yeah. is, so which is not quite what happens. So okay, that's what I wanted to know. So you don't have a relaxation yeah. oscillation. Yeah. You know that. Okay. okay. All right. Okay. So yeah, no. It, it, okay. Okay. You're okay. saying it would be exactly right in a relaxation yeah. oscillator. This is not a relaxation oscillator. Okay. Okay. So uh, so again, I'll just recap. So we have the model. Points of potential mechanism. You can understand the mechanism, I'm not explaining it because I don't think it's particularly illuminating, it's relatively complex, but you can explain it in a couple of paragraphs and see what the different molecular interactions are or propose a different set of molecular interactions that cause these two oscillators, positive feedback, to pull everything together in these large tracks. Okay, so <clears throat> what we looked at next is. Uh, here we go. Oh, I think you should keep going. Okay. So I mean, this is, this is not. Te a technically, you have until nine thirty-five, but you've had okay. a ton of questions. So I think. Okay. All right. So, <clears throat> what we've done what we looked at next is this uh, is a tree that is three strain consortium, and so rather than two strains, we have three strains that communicate again via form sensing <coughs> molecules. In a, and this is a very standard uh, motif that we've seen in the before where strain X activates strain Y and strain X activates strain Z, but strain Y represses strain Z. So what you expect to see is a pulse in strain Z, right? So this, you have a delayed, through this longer pathway, you have a delayed in activation of strain Z once you induce uh, strain X, which then first is activated via strain X, and then after some time is repressed via strain Y, generating a pulse. So you can get little this, I'm not gonna go through the details of this, um, maybe it's on, is the person who did the experiment in Matt's lab, made a subject, made a subject for, was, uh, did the uh, computational analysis. 
Anything what you see is, is pulsing, but it's a little compounded by something. So this is not quite as clean because what you get is <coughs> the cell's interstationary phase about, so these are not grown in microfluidic devices anymore, they're grown in wells. So the interstationary phase about 260, 250, 260 minutes after you start growing. Mm -hmm. This pulse here is not generated due to the circuit, it's simply because cells stop growing. Right? So they stop expressing the fluorescent protein and it's being degraded. This, this part over here is again. Uh, due to this uh, the stationary phase. So really the interesting part is everything that happens before 250, mils, 250 minutes before the cells stop growing. And indeed if you look, the pulse, and the predicted pulse in strain Z is, does happen before that time. Right? So um, we did some control experiments to see that this is in fact due to the circuit itself and not due to maybe strain Z stopping growing before the other strains or anything like that. <coughs> So, what we did then is uh, did this, we did a series of experiment, <coughs> experiments um, and asked what is going to be, um, if you change the ratio of these three strains in these, uh, micro in, 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 these, in these wells, what is going to be the effect of the dynamics of the circuit? So, um, to simplify this somewhat, we kept strain Z at the fixed ratios, always at one third of the entire volume and change the ratio of strain X to strain Y. So from one to nine, so strain X, uh, one-tenth of the remaining two-thirds that are remain after we fill uh, the well with strain Z. And the nine-tenths uh, to, uh, go to strain Y, all the way to nine-tenths of the two-thirds to uh, occupy by strain X and one-tenth by strain Y. <clears throat> and what you see in strain X is you know, what you predict. As you increase, as you increase the ratio of strain X, the signal from strain X goes up. There's more strain X, it produces more fluorescent protein, the signal goes up. Uh, at the same time, again, because they're uh, they're summed together to two thirds of the entire volume, strain Y Y signal goes down. Right? So this goes down, and then what you would predict then, although strain Z is at the constant fraction, the the ratio of strain Z is not changed from one third. As you increase the ratio of strain X, the signal, the activating signal from strain X increases, and at the same time, the repressing signal from strain Y decreases, right, because you know, have the two sides of the scale, which, would, which predicts, and which you see in experiments, that the uh, pulse in strain Z increases as you increase the ratio of uh, strain X and decrease the ratio of strain Y, so this is, you know, as, as you would imagine. This, in fact, happens repeatedly so what we did here is now look at the what we asked is how much can you predict right so in the previous case we were asking more about a mechanism here we're going to propose a model and then try to predict from a few experiments what this peak height and the peak shape is going to be in the other experiments right so can we do effectively uh, extrapolate uh, and <clears throat> predict the behavior of the circuit across a larger set of experimental, experimental conditions from just measurements from the people. So <clears throat> for that, um, we went through a series of experiments and fitted a number of models and came up with kind of a minimal model that captures the behavior of the systems really well. You have cell growth, which is logistic growth. These are the, the three strains grow at approximately the same rates. And uh, in, the, uh, in this well, we have the expression of uh, strain X, uh, which is just uh, uh, subject to enzymatic degradation and dilution. Uh, strain Y uh, gets an input signal from strain X, right? This is the signal from strain X, and again, it's subject to uh, enzymatic degradation and dilution. And strain Z gets an activating signal from strain X and a repressing signal from strain Y, and again, enzymatic, uh, uh, enzymatic degradation and dilution. And then we also have to include, we try both with signaling, without explicitly modeling signaling, modeling signaling explicitly <coughs> does seem to work better. And so what that now allows you to do is to fit the model to one experiment, to fit the model to one experiment, Let's say right here. So this is a the set of ratios. Remember, we're only changing the ratios of x and y, which gives us a simplex of possibilities, right? Because the uh, rx and ry have to add up to to one. The remaining, the remaining, uh, what remains in the trap. And um, <clears throat> so. Um, 
uh, should say more. So, so here we can actually also vary. Here we also allow to vary uh, z as well, right? So r x and r y and r z have to add up to one, which gives us a simplex. And based on these experiments, let's say with just one experiment, a particular ratio of r x and r y with r z depend, uh, uh, determined by the from the sum of these two, uh, you can predict across the entire trap using the model what the height, what the height of the peak and expression of strength z is going to be. Right. So what you do is you take one of these previous experiments, let's say this one, you fit the model to the experiment with these Bayesian techniques to do that, and from that you, you take all three recordings, and from this, let's say, from just this one experiment, you predict the entire rest of these time courses. In particular, what we're interested in here, what I'm plotting is, is the height at the maximum of this uh, peak. And the model works relatively well, right? So again, so this is the experiment, and this is the model. And um, you can get a relatively good agreement between the two, with the agreement really diverging at low ratios, right? When the ratio of y is relatively low, then that reduces to fluctuations. You don't actually get such a good prediction. But over a relatively long range, uh, again, this is kind of a, a form of cross-validation. You fit it to one set of experiments, you predict another set of experiments. You get a relatively good agreement. And then what we asked is, can you control, you can use that to control the height of the peak. So you take one set of experiments, you predict the peak height across different ratios of the strain x and x and y, and then find a, essentially an isoclinic curve of, of, along which you predict the heights of the peaks to be constant. Right? So you can just do it via you know, essentially just numerical techniques. Then go back, give those to David. David mixes these strains together, measures the peak, and then you check whether the peak heights are constant. Right? And unfortunately, they're not. So you don't get this. So what, what happens, you can then do sequencing experiments. What actually happened in this case is that David was not quite able to get these ratios exactly right. Okay, so there was actually a systematic deviation in the experiments due to things that we don't really understand that, uh, that gave, gave us that, um, that, so that the ratios were not the ones that, were, that we uh, wished them to be, but actually deviated. And actually, once you use those sequencing experiments, to, um, to predict the peak, of the, again, not using the experimental data, you use separate sequencing experiments to find out what the ratio of Rx and Ry is that David actually used, then you again get the relative to the good of you. Right? So this is what, more of a, it's not really a failure of the model, it's a limitation of the experimental techniques that leads to this, uh, this disagreement. Uh, so what else can we do? We can ask uh, the cell arrangements, which I'm not going to talk about, but you can ask why cells arrange. Uh, in these vertical patterns, uh, we can use lattice models to try to understand this, which are really retractable, which part of Kahn Chen is working on uh, these questions that we told you before. Or you can use agent based models or a combination of the rough that then tell you why the spatial arrangements in traps with certain boundaries is of more uh, heterogeneous, or uh, if you use open boundaries, if you use open boundaries, you get more strike behavior. This is James Nichols working on this, right? So, to engineer and understand complex systems, we will need, we'll need mathematical models. I don't think there's going to be a way forward without really using mathematical models. Um, fitting models to data remains a challenge, both from the data side. We say there's a lot of data, but frequently the data is somewhat limited, both in um, uh, both in the, in the shape that it comes to, it comes in. Right? It's hard to analyze directly from these imaging experiments in particular. And ultimately, what you would get is a model. <clears throat> That's, I think, satisfying from uh, both the engineering side. Uh, you know, it allows you to build something. But once you have a model that actually works, you can also look into under the hood and try to understand the mechanisms that make certain things work in the way. You know, when it comes to the, um, you know, the coordination of the oscillations. Across the, you know, the, the wide flow um, <coughs> cell. You know, I thought you were going to talk about, um, you know, trigger waves or rapid diffusion waves, the kinds of things that, um, that you know, for example, um, Jim Ferrell has right, thought about in other ways. I mean, do you think it's a similar, is that a similar mechanism? What's going on? Yeah, you, I mean, you could see them in, in the smooth. You could see they're, these. They're, they're just waves. harder to analyze at the time resolution. Look, it's just that you're somewhat limited at the. Um, you know, you're limited by 
Sure, sure. Kant is a critic, but that would be the working hypothesis for how that was. Yeah, certainly. So it's just that we were not, you know, the, you would see maybe the wave propagates in about two frames yeah. Uh, yeah. in images. Yeah. And you know, these images are not taken too correctly because of the size yes. of the trap. Yeah. They're, ta they're taken in about 200 microns, yeah. microns, so they're not synchronous. Um, so these, yeah. these oscillations that occur on yeah. this time scale of uh, 30, 40 minutes, yeah. you can capture them really nicely. Yeah. Waves, they happen yeah. much shorter. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Mr. Uh, again for a great talk. <laughs> All right, next up, uh, Johan Paulson, I'll just let you take over for running five minutes like you. Uh, yeah, it's great to be here. 